Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman Family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 243, Organizing the Grassroots. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And today, as we continue our series on feminism and the American Jewish community, we are thrilled to welcome two leaders of the National Council of Jewish Women. The National Council of Jewish Women, or NCJW, is the oldest Jewish women's grassroots organization in the United States. It was founded in 1893. NCJW works to improve the lives of the most vulnerable women, families, and children in the United States and Israel. It's a grassroots organization of volunteers and advocates who turn progressive ideals into action. Our guests today are Sheila Katz and Danya Ruttenberg. Sheila Katz is the CEO of the National Council of Jewish Women. Prior to coming to NCJW, Sheila Katz served as the Vice President for Student Engagement and Leadership at Hillel International. During her time at Hillel International, she led numerous programs, including co-founding and directing Ask Big Questions, which helps guide students through conversations to help them understand themselves and others. And she also spearheaded Meets Vote, Hillel's nonpartisan civic engagement campaign that helped 19,000 students register to vote or request absentee ballots leading up to the 2018 midterm elections. In 2019, Sheila Katz was named one of the 50 most influential Jews in the United States by the Forward newspaper. Danya Ruttenberg serves as scholar-in-residence at the National Council of Jewish Women, and she is also an award-winning author and writer. Her books include a memoir, Surprised by God, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Religion, as well as The Passionate Torah, Sex and Judaism, and Yentl's Revenge, The Next Wave of Jewish Feminism, for which she served as editor. Her most recent book is called Nurture the Wow, Finding Spirituality in the Frustration, Boredom, Tears, Poop, Desperation, Wonder, and Radical Amazement of Parenting. She's currently working on a book applying the ancient framework of repentance and repair to the contemporary public square, institutions, and national policy. Donya Ruttenberg also worked in the past at Hillel International, as well as Hillel's at Tufts University and Northwestern University. She was also a leader in the Ask Big Questions Project, as well as Avodah, an organization dedicated to creating leaders for economic justice. Donya Ruttenberg has been listed on all the lists of influential, important rabbis, including the Daily Beast's 10 Rabbis to Watch and the Forward's Top 50 Most Influential Women Rabbis. In our world of online Judaism, she's a famous Twitter celebrity tweeting at at the R-A-D-R. She has rabbinical ordination from the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. Sheila Katz, Danya Ruttenberg, welcome to Judaism Unbounded. So great to have you. Thank you. So great to be here. Well, when we launched this series a few weeks ago, it happened to be an I should admit, I guess it wasn't fully intentional. It it just was was good timing that it happened to be the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the 19th Amendment uh, that gave the right to vote to women in 1920. And uh, I was looking around at the NCJW website and NCJW was founded in 1893. So about 27 years before the 19th Amendment. So I I thought that might be an interesting way to understand why it was created in the first place. Was it driven by the beginnings of the women's suffrage movement or were there other factors that led to its being founded? Sure, I'm happy to take this on. And and I'll also just comment that it's been 100 years since white women have had the right to vote in this country. It was several decades later before uh, black women and other people of color who are women were able to have that same right. Uh, But NCJW founding, you know, is actually a really great and challenging story all wrapped into one. The short version is that we were invited to present at the Chicago World Fair that year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lots of Chicago people on this call, which is exciting. Um, and, And we were the only Jewish women who had been invited to present. It's not a World Fair the way, you you know, people think of fairs now, more like an Aspen Ideas Festival. And, uh, and when Hannah G. Solomon, our founder, 
arrived, she and the Jewish women she were with were asked to pour coffee instead. Mm. So she said, no, thank you, left. And with those women, they formed the National Council of Jewish Women to make sure that Jewish women had a seat at the table to advocate for the things that mattered to them. And what's interesting now, you know, over 125 years later, is most of our issues are the same which I think is both exciting and challenging. It's exciting because we've seen how much progress there's been on some of these core issues, voting being one of them. And yet here we are still talking about voter suppression today. And here we are still talking about voter suppression as it relates to the most vulnerable, particularly the black community, lower income individuals and people with disabilities. And we're still obviously focusing on the issue of abortion, reproductive health rights and justice. You're a part of the entire journey to make sure that people had access to abortions and fought for Roe v. Wade, we're actually at probably one of the most pivotal moments for reproductive health rights and justice that this country has ever had. And it's going to potentially be a moment where those rights are reversed. And so I think there's so much to celebrate, just like the 19th Amendment, about how far we've come. And there's just a lot more work to do to make sure we can fully see through the unfinished work of both the 19th Amendment and women and all people having equal access and equal protection under the law. I'll just make a note that for the National Council of Jewish Women, when we use the term women, it's an expansive term to include anyone who identifies with the term, which is cis women, trans women, femme, feminine identifying, genderqueer, and non-binary folks. So just throughout our talking about this today, uh, just know that that uh, is our current definition as we're thinking about just gender generally and the term woman, um, particularly on our issue of abortion, right? Trans men need abortions too. So you'll hear us constantly refer to this as a right for people who can become pregnant um, rather than just making it about women. But I do think we need more people to come to the table. The fact is, it has been a lonely place for us to be working on the issue of abortion. And there's a lot of Jewish organizations who take on advocacy work who don't see this as theirs. And they don't see this as theirs because those organizations have been run by men forever and ever and ever. One of the things I'd like to see is a shift in the Jewish world to take on the issues that disproportionately impact women and see those as Jewish values and Jewish issues as well. So it's not as isolating. We need to make sure that every single day we're fighting for the rights of women, children, and families in this country. I'm constantly obsessed with names of things, with titles of things. Um, and I ask a lot of organizations that come on this show to talk about their names because I think there's often much more there than we realize. A few things strike me about the name National Council of Jewish Women. One, it's of and not for. And mm -hmm. that's actually a really that not every organization that centers on a group of people thinks of itself as of that group of people as opposed to for. There's a there's kind of a I was about to uh, I was about to say paternalism. It wouldn't be paternalism for a women's organization, but there's like a maternalism. There's a parental instinct in defining yourself as ah we are in an organization for this group of people that I think can be off putting for those people themselves because you want to be shaping the change. You want to be as a Jewish woman, I mean, I don't want to speak as a Jewish woman, but as a Jewish person, I want to be a part of a, a Jewish organization that is of Jews, not for Jews, right? Um, so that's a cool thing already. Then there's the piece that sort of has started to come up about how we define what women are. Um, and then uh, beyond that, there's what what makes this Jewish, What like what is it to have Jewish interests at heart in an organization? What What does that lead an organization to do and act and manifest in the world? And maybe that brings me to you, Danya, as the scholar in residence. Um, talk us through how you understand that Jewish piece here, too, because it's not as simple as, ah, you know, we, this organization, are finding texts in Jewish sources that, you know, we can tie to some. I mean, that's also a cool thing to do. But like, how does uh, you how does your approach along the lines of sort of what makes an issue Jewish work? And what does that look like when it's actualized by you as staff, by your lay leaders, by your whole group of not for women? I think that of is really important. NCJW from the very beginning was an organization of Jewish women doing work for women, children, and families for everyone, right? They were arguing in 1908 
for anti-lynching laws, right, for federal anti-lynching laws. They were, they established birth control clinics in the 1940s that eventually got rolled into Planned Parenthood, right? The work has been for everybody all along, and the understanding and the values underpinning all along have been that we as Jews understand that we have an obligation to work for our own people, and the first wave of NCGW work was in part a more established German Jews working with Russian Jewish immigrants and that, but they were also, you know, child labor laws impacted people across the spectrum. It's establishing Meals on Wheels programs impacted people across the spectrum. Sheila talked about the establishment of NCJW, and the piece of the story that she didn't tell is that when Jewish women realized that we were going to be expected to be pouring coffee, at uh, the World's Fair, they said, you know, we're just going to have our own conference instead. And so the Jewish Women's Conference then became NCJW, but I have those papers from that first conference in 1893. And you have Ray Frank, who's known as Girl Rabbi of the Golden West and is a whole person to, to understand, uh, talking about the Torah of this work. You have people talking about labor laws and Judaism. People understood from then and all the way through till now, that our work as Jews, in some ways it's through the Jewish legal tradition, in some ways it's through Jewish values uh, more broadly expressed, that our job is to work for a more just world for everyone. We bring a Jewish lens, right? When we talk about reproductive rights, health, and justice, we're talking about the fact that you know, the Torah, the Mishnah, the Talmud, Jewish law says abortion is absolutely permitted, sometimes required, right? So from our perspective, abortion rights are non-negotiable. And we bring a reproductive justice lens, which is a reproductive justice is a, a movement that was started by Black and Indigenous women to say we need to focus on not just abortion access, but the whole experience of our rights to be free from eugenics and sterilization, you know, mass incarceration and unjust policing. It's all of these things. And in the space, NCJW is both animated by Jewish values and Jewish texts that, that really provide the, the rocket fuel to the work. And also the understanding that we are doing this work in the world and in broader coalition with other people who now in this moment are sometimes e even more impacted by unjust laws than we are. So, it, you know, <laughs> reproductive access is a, is a Jewish issue and it's an everybody issue. And in some ways, Jews need to, Jews, white Jews in particular, need to be allies in this work. And in some ways we need to be leading because it's a, an issue of um, freedom of religion also, right? Taking a Christian definition of when life begins and turning that into legislation and telling Jews that they can't have abortions is a religious freedom issue. And simultaneously, communities of color, particularly black communities, low-income communities are disproportionately impacted by abortion restrictions. So one issue, but um, sort of shows the approach. I'm thinking about this new position that was established that you're that you're now the first person to be occupying, yep. which is a scholar in residence for an organization like this. And I'm just thinking about the vast number of Jewish organizations that don't have a scholar in residence. And, you know, I'm just sort of thinking about uh, how we could talk about the work in this case of NCJW, but I think also more broadly, the work of all Jewish organizations that might be classified grossly, you know, that other people, I wouldn't classify this as, but other people would classify them as, quote, secular, right? That they're not, they're not a synagogue. They're not about Jewish religious practice. And, and nevertheless, uh, you know, and, and so I think that a lot of times, at, at least in history up till recently, those organizations have, I think, been thought of and thought themselves as we're a bunch of Jews that are doing stuff together and we care that we're Jewish, but the content of Jewishness isn't really what's animating us here. So what's animating us here is, uh, you know, American values or whatever it might be. 
and not that we're going to whip out a Jewish text or that we're going to uh, really talk about how everything that we do is coming out of the Jewish tradition. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you hope to to bring, like how NCJW's work might change as a result of whatever you're going to do there. And Sheila, I'd love to hear from you as well, because obviously you created the position. So what was the what was the the aspiration? But from both of you, I'm really wondering, you know, how you imagine that the work of an organization like this might change, bringing on somebody whose work is really deep in the substance of of Judaism, of Jewish civilization, Jewish text, Jewish tradition, etc. NCJW has done extraordinary work for a long time, and I'm excited to help the organization move to the next level in taking that J seriously and, and having it mean something and have, being really thoughtful about how larger term justice goals, some of the strategic plans, uh, some of the work we are doing to help move the wider Jewish community can have Jewish DNA, that it's not going to be about developing a plan and then sprinkling some Jewish text over the top, um, as we see a lot in the Jewish community, but really the wisdom of the tradition, different Jewish methodologies and approaches and ways of thinking, how can that be, be informing what we're doing? And, and how do we, we offer work that is really substantial on that level? both for the 200,000 plus advocates that we have on the ground who are doing this work in the trenches, and also as we work with the wider Jewish community. We want to create a, a sea change in the thinking and in the work. And, and in order to have the kind of impact we need to have, it needs to be substantial and grounded. And I'll add, I look for every and all excuse to work with Danya always. Um, so personally, this is very exciting. And, and I think there's several things here. I mean, Danya just hit so many of them, but also as uh, the oldest Jewish women's organization in this country, we have a pattern of doing phenomenal work and not taking credit for it, which is very gendered. Like we helped found Planned Parenthood. We were the only NGO at Ellis Island making sure women and children weren't being trafficked. And then as Israel was founded, went there to help children who are Holocaust survivors be able to acclimate to Israel. We have a long story of success legislatively, of success on the ground, of compassionate response. And, and so while we do want to focus on some of those things in the past, we also want to make sure as we're doing that work right now, we tell the story because part of being a feminist today as we work towards equality for everyone also means being able to say loudly and proudly when we've accomplished something. And so Danya is going to help be our storyteller and root things as well. Um, and as far as the Jewish part goes, it's so important because we see a lot of Jewish organizations with the light touch. That's not what NCJW advocates are looking for. And to be honest, it's not how you move legislation and action in this country. People want to have a deep understanding. They might not want to like look at a text sheet that's all Hebrew all the time, but they want to be able to understand deeply what our tradition says about this. And they want to hear about that in a feminist interpretation, not, which is not always the interpretation that people receive. So abortion is really the best example of this. For a long time, we've said we believe in the inherent worth of every person, you know, et cetera, et cetera, name every Jewish value that every Jewish organization has. But when we do our advocacy, it is important that our tradition goes deeper than that. Our tradition actually defines what these things look like and actually permits abortion. And being able to zoom into that text, being able to teach people that text, allows us to deploy people out into the world who are thoughtful and educated and smart and care about being Jewish to be able to say that the public narrative that exists, that abortion and faith don't go together, cannot be said in our name. And it's actually our text that is being misinterpreted. Since Danya has been here, we've launched our Rabbis for Repro campaign, which now has a thousand rabbis who have signed on from every kind of background of Judaism, from every kind of background generally, who have signed on to say, this is a Jewish issue. There's pastoral care we need to do to make sure we're, you know, including abortion as one of the many things we talk about with the people in our communities. And 
we are going to say loudly and proudly that abortion is permitted in Judaism. And to me, that is, that cannot, it's not only that it can transform the Jewish world because people should be able to hear the words. One in four people under 45 have an abortion, people who can get pregnant. And that's a large statistic to never hear anybody talk about it ever. Um, but two, this has the potential power to transform the national conversation about abortion. And so I'm just so proud that we have our first ever scholar in residence and that it's Danya. And I'll just, I just have to say this, many, many organizations have scholars in residence and many, many of those organizations have traditionally only hired men. And it is rare to see women's organizations in this because it's rare to see women have the privilege to be able to have a job in which they get to think and talk and preach and act based off of their values and who they are in sync with their organizations. So I am super proud that NCJW gets to have our first scholar in residence. And I would encourage other Jewish organizations that are considering people for roles like that to also pay attention to how many men have been afforded roles like that and how many women are being asked to do that work for free. I mean, um, I love that you started your answer, Sheila, with I look for every excuse to work with Danya ever. Um, <laughs> that I believe is the direct quote. And I actually want to I want to go. I know that was just like, a. I mean, you meant it clearly and sincerely, but it also could have been like a, a quick comment. I actually want to go there because um, and in the spirit of like Jewish texts and traditions, I'm thinking of a particular text from Pirkei Avot, which actually says in two bullet points, um, you've covered two bullet points at once. It says, Asei lecha rav, um, roughly make for yourself a rabbi. That's literally like, Danya's a rabbi. Here we are, hiring a rabbi. Um, and the next clause is, Kone lecha chaver, um, in this case, chavera. Find for yourself, it's kind of acquire for yourself, which I don't love, but like, find for yourself a friend. It is clear to me, I, um, I, I, I've known... Sheila, I've known you for many years. Danya, I haven't known you as well, but we've been in touch for many years. Like, as somebody as like observing both of you flourishing in the Jewish world, like there are many ways that I've sort of thought of you linked to each other. And I think that's such a cool thing. You did work together with Ask Big Questions and with Hillel and now with National Council of Jewish Women. And I, I want to ask, like, what is it to have somebody that can play that role with you, that can be your comrade in arms in in the work that you do it's a very special thing and honestly i've been reflecting on this too because we're five years into this podcast and like lots of the people we've interviewed they started at one organization and they're not at that same organization anymore or they're i mean maybe they're not even working directly in the jewish world anymore but they're like we're still deeply in touch with them and like these are people you know no matter where we're working no matter what we're doing like we're going to be in the work together and i think that there's such a power there and in a world that defines our lives so much in terms of like where we're working and not who we're working with. I'd love to just ask the two of you, since you've worked with each other in multiple contexts, like what's the power there? What is that for you to have each other in this work? Sheila's a visionary and a force of nature, both. And it's been so fun over the years to get to dream and scheme with her and to make stuff happen. Sheila isn't limited by the fact that something hasn't been done before or it is a wild and outlandish idea and she's able to sort of pull it off. And our friendship has evolved over the years as well as our working relationship. Um, you know, when I was at Hillel, people would say, well, what exactly is your role at Hillel International? And I would say, I am Sheila Katz's pet rabbi. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, totally happy to be. It was so fun, you know, it's the interplay of her big wild thinking and my big wild thinking and what she thought was a good idea and what I thought was a good idea and what I thought was fun to do just meshed. And when she went over to NCJW and we started talking about the this is a possibility, it was just like, here's somebody that I like and trust and know that I enjoy working with and... You know, we have real conversations about real things that matter. It would be it would be an absolute pleasure if it worked out. And I'm thrilled that it has. Danya is my rabbi and she is my friend. And it is such a, a, a beautiful quote uh, and to think about this in our tradition. And I think uh, it's important that we have people um, who we look to to be able to guide us 
both on our personal spiritual path and to be able to guide our organization to live up to the values that we have. Many organizations claim to have Jewish values and then you see how they treat people, whether um, how they're leaving the organization, how their family leave policy, whatever it may be. It's important to have somebody who can help push to make sure what you say and what you do are aligned. And Danya does that from a really loving place, but will still tell you if you gotta do something better, which is important. And as a friend, like it's just so important to have people who you can also just talk with about mm -hmm. uh, things outside of work. And you know, the lines are blurred, blurred for activists because we live this work. This is our life. These are our hobbies. Most <laughs> of my staff right here, when you ask what they do in their spare time, they're like volunteering at a domestic violence shelter. They're teaching kids something. They're doing whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's that's work too, but I'm glad you consider that <laughs> your personal fun time. Um, and I'll just say, without going into too many details, when I was at a particular low point in my life, I was sitting with Danya, I was telling her how hard it was, and she literally took my phone and on WhatsApp created a group called Team Sheila and said, name your five closest people that you talk to about this moment. I shared my five people, she invited them to come, and she literally said, this is Danya, I'm texting you from Sheila's phone. This is now Team Sheila, and we're going to offer her support from here. And like doing that really, really helped me get through a difficult phase in my life. And having a friend who saw, oh, you could use some support, and I'm just going to create a text group so that you get what you need. Like you can't replace that. So for me, you know, I've got a lot of great. There, I mean, everyone who works at NCJW is extraordinary. I hope you have all of them on the show at some point. Uh, that would be many, many, many episodes, but. Um, it is really, really an amazing thing to have a work environment where you trust and respect the people around you. And I think a lot of Jewish organizations say they have that. It doesn't mean they necessarily do. And by Danya being added to the team here, not just for me, it's so clear how quickly she's able to become friends and rabbis for the people who are here. I think it's a unique and wonderful skill that she brings, and it's going to make our entire organization stronger. I want to try to bring a few ideas together. One is that I'm thinking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and that time that she was asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And she said, when there are nine, you know, and when she was asked about that, or I think what people interpret what she meant by that, it's just that, well, there were only there were nine men for 200 years. And so there's no problem in there being nine women for a while. Uh, but I think you could take that somewhere else and say, actually, a Supreme Court that had nine women on it would be very different from a Supreme Court that had nine men or six men. And the question is, how do we think about that? And that actually was making me think about how the uh, Torah reading on the second day of Rosh Hashanah is the Binding of Isaac story. And I was talking about it. We were doing a project about it. And I was talking about it with someone at some point, And I don't remember exactly the conversation, but a woman would be very unlikely to have ever written this story in the first place. Like, this is a horrible story about, you know, sacrificing your child. It's hard to imagine a woman writing that story. And those things together kind of bring me to this question of, of kind of that I think of as a question of universal design, you know, which is really this question of, you know, universal design in architecture is like, what if the people with disabilities actually designed the building from the beginning? You know, it wouldn't just have a ramp. It would have so many things that, you know, a lot of people can't even imagine. But but ultimately, it would be very uh, highly accessible, more so than than. It, it could easily be imagined. And one of the other pieces that when we talk about universal design in the world of disability is that people talk about how it turns out that when you design a building to be accessible to people who are in a wheelchair, for example, it turns out that it's also perfectly accessible for strollers. Strollers are often pushed by women. And so you've actually made a building that is accessible to women, even though that wasn't really your intent. And I guess I'm wondering how we might take some of these ideas and bring them into the context of an organization of and for women and all the, all the things that we talked about, the of and the for, but they really say, like, of course, we all want there to be equality and accessibility for women. But like, I want more than that. You know, I want a world in which women are organizing everything, everything, because I think it would be a better world. What would it look like to have a movement towards remaking all of the institutions of our society, basically, in a way that would probably be more humane. I want to distinguish between women and feminist for the purposes of this. Right? You, Dan, you mentioned uh, that we read the Binding of Isaac at Rosh Hashanah. 
we also at Rosh Hashanah read the story of Sarah, the matriarch, kicking out Hagar, the in- woman who was enslaved to her, because Sarah was jealous that and, and concerned that Hagar's child, who Hagar was forced to conceive because she was enslaved, <laughs> might inherit some of the family money. We see women throughout history do things that are not inherently feminist, right? Women were complicit in the Holocaust. Women were complicit in the antebellum South and slavery, right? As we're recording this, there is a woman who has been nominated to the Supreme Court who is not a friend to women or women's rights or reproductive health access and safety for women and non-binary folks and trans men and lots of other people. The fact that someone happens to be female does not mean that that person is not aligned with patriarchy and or aligned with other kinds of oppressions. I always understood when there are nine people who care about women's rights and justice Notably, Justice Ginsburg wore, she had, I don't know if people know this, uh, she was obviously famous for her uh, collars, and she had one that had the word tzedek embroidered on it, justice. Reminiscence of the Torah verse, justice, justice, you shall pursue, which is about a fair and independent judiciary. And she wore this collar on the first day of the arguments about whether or not LGBTQ people should be covered under sex discrimination law. The understanding was not just that we're helping women in this very narrow way, but that justice means that we're fighting for all people of all genders and all backgrounds, and it's her record on voting rights. She was, she was in it for everyone. When you have a feminist lens, that's clear. Feminism is and should be an inherently liberatory framework. And though white feminists have gotten this wrong many times throughout history, it should be about liberation for everyone. I don't think just putting someone who is a woman in a place of power is the way to magically change oppressive systems. But bringing a feminist lens to the work and saying, who is most vulnerable here? Who needs our help? and support, and care, and protection, and that's when bringing a feminist lens can transform the work. And yes, the Jewish community would be much better if we could bring that lens to everything we do. Dan and I, since the beginning of this podcast, have been wrestling with, I mean, we've got a few core questions, but one of the core questions is theories of change. Like how, given that we have a bunch of goals for the future of Judaism, we being us as like the two of us, but also we like broadly speaking, progressive Jews, like um, given that we have a bunch of goals for the Jewish future and for the world's future, how do we go about that? And we've talked, you know, over and over again from our very beginnings about like, from our perspective, one of the most important projects is not only working from the place of centralized national organizations with beautiful legacies. It's also about setting up stuff specifically that is not those organizations. And so I want to talk to y'all as sort of, from my perspective, comrades that are going about this work very differently, right? Like um, you are part of an organization with 127 years of history. Both of you have done powerful, amazing work from the, the place specifically of large national bodies. And I'm curious, like, on that power building front, what why is it important for that to be happening there? Like, talk to people like me, to be frank, and like others who are often very deeply skeptical. Maybe, honestly, I feel like my whole generation in many ways, a lot of us are skeptical of, of, of large centralized projects. But then I look to an organization like NCJW that is doing amazing work. And I, I honestly, I feel pushed on my theory of change. What is it to do this work specifically from the place of a national body with a legacy and with power? And and also maybe to the extent you also want to voice this, like what can those who aren't in those positions bring to the table as well? 
I'm happy to start and just say one of the reasons I was so excited about coming to serve at the helm of this organization is because we're actually a grassroots organization. Uh, when I learned, I didn't know this coming in, that our constituents and advocates vote on the issues that we take on and they vote on our policies. And I was like, oh, I'm leading this organization and, the, and I don't get to decide that. And then I was like, this is amazing. I'm so happy about this because it means that the people on the ground are helping to decide the priorities and the issues that we take on. So we're 180,000 advocates strong and the magic of NCJW happens locally. Nationally is super important. We wrote the first Violence Against Women Act. We co-authored the second Violence Against Women Act that we're still pushing through. But what we do nationally looks different locally, but it complements each other. There are certain things if you remove yourself from the national table, you don't get to influence. And what we have said is we wanna be everywhere. And so it's important for us to have two kinds of ways that we model that intersect with each other in order to create change. So, so that's one in our local sections to me is where it's at. One of the first changes we made is we got rid of membership nationally. And when people sign up nationally, we don't ask them for money. We ask them for where they are and their email address and we push them to get involved locally. Um, so that's important. And the second thing I'd say is this, we need everyone to be working their magic in different ways. So, you know, it is unlike us. Well, I shouldn't say it's unlike us. We protest all the time. There are certain spaces where we have to show up and be in relationship and be in conversation where we're not going to publicly criticize in the same way because we're the voice needed to be behind the scenes, right? But when we're behind the scenes, it doesn't mean we don't value the voices that are outside and kind of being very loud. We need each other. And so I would just say there's a role for the grassroots, there's a role for national organization, there's a role for individuals to organize who are not affiliated with any organization. They often have the most flexibility and power, and we'd be happy to be supportive of uh, the work of any person who wants to mobilize to make things better for women, children, and families. But I don't think we're the only path, but I think we're an important path that begins in the grassroots and kind of concludes nationally for us to see through the vision that has started locally. We need all hands on deck, and there's a lot of deck. There are a lot of ways and places that the work needs to be done. And, and CJW is occupying a lot of those spaces, right? The, on, the, on the Hill, in lobbying, writing laws, working with lawmakers, local, level there's also service work that a lot of our sections do like really incredible hands-on direct service things because we need to be worrying about tomorrow and we need to be worrying about today both right there are so we need people who are on the outside agitating and we need people inside the meeting who have a certain kind of credibility to try to push for things to change right we need all of it I'm thinking about this connection between, you know, what Lex asked about the large organizations and the startups. And I'm thinking about how social media has its ills, but it also has its its positives. And mm -hmm. you're somebody who's got a lot of Twitter followers. You know, you've, you're somebody who's made use of Twitter as a way of getting your voice out. And I'm just curious about your reflections on what that level of the, the one person who finds a way of, uh, like something like Twitter that can amplify your voice and how you think about using that voice versus how you think about using the voice that is you when you're working for a national organization versus thinking about your, your writing about parenting, for example, which in a sense empowers uh, regular people to kind of operate on the level of the small, the small, right? The family, the, the small circle of, of influence. And putting all of those together. And I'm also curious about your thoughts and Sheila, also your thoughts on like, again, I, I think that clarification about feminism was really helpful to me. I, I think that I'm thinking about what is a world that includes large organizations and startups and individuals look like when it's organized the way that a feminist lens might organize it? Because I think that a lot of my feelings that oh, the big organizations are never going to solve these problems. You know, it comes from the non-feminist way that it's organized. And, and I think that I'm probably right within that frame, but I'm curious how a new relationship might look like between large organizations, small organizations, and, and individuals. Listen, there are maybe 
four realms. I saw someone at some point break this down to four. I wish I could remember who it was so that I could credit them. But uh, if you think of spheres of influence as yourself, your family, your community, and engagement with the larger world, right? All of these are realms that need love and attention and care and time where you're focusing on growth and where there's an extra emphasis. And we probably can't do all four at the highest level of focus at all times. It's just, it's not possible. We are finite people. And so there are times when people need to do the deep internal work. And whether that's healing from trauma, whether that's, and I'm speaking as a white person, working on the racism or other oppressions that we've internalized, that kind of work. Like there are times we need to focus on our family, on the people who are in our immediate sphere. And so that speaks to my book on parenting. There are times when our immediate community needs our focus and times when engagement in the larger world needs our focus. And we have these new strange social squares that are run by private corporations, you know, wealthy individuals, rich white guys, uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of these are in some ways these amazing spaces where we can connect and share ideas. Um, the Arab Spring wouldn't have been what it was without Twitter. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, right? All of these things, these major movements developed and were erupted because of social media and our ability to share ideas and connect. And uh, they have real limits and, and issues in part because they are run by people who are focused on making money. I think we need to, to mine these platforms for the good that they can offer while also naming the, the limits and pushing for better solutions to problems than free-flowing disinformation and allowing Nazis to roam freely and all of that. I don't know how much tension there is between the different organizations who all have similar goals but are operating differently. Um, I think there is space for everyone. And my first day as CEO was um, never again actions first action where they got arrested at the ICE detention center in New Jersey. And I remember thinking- I was there. You were there. Oh, that was my first sorry. day as CEO. So I remember thinking, this is amazing. This is phenomenal. I've never been arrested. I've never wanted to be arrested, but I would get arrested for this. And thinking about how phenomenal it was that a group of Jews, particularly young Jews, got together and said, we need to be doing something more and we need to root this in our own way. And the way they've taken off is so inspiring. I also, at NCJW, we have a hundred year history with Hyas, formerly the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and now they just go as Hyas. And I just love their mission and how they also do things because we are Jews and they help everybody now and that they've evolved over the years to still remain as relevant as they are today. And the National Council of Jewish Women, we're mixed in this too because we do a lot of work on immigration as it relates to gender-based violence and that the majority reason people are seeking to come into our country for asylum is because of gender-based violence. And the way we receive those women and families and children says a lot about who we are as a country. So I would just say, you know, the more the merrier and how inspiring it is to see people step up and take action if, if they feel that there is a void. And also just name because it's the fun history of NCJW. You know, I see us as very similar to Never Again Action 127 years ago. We were the kind of startup, you know, loud voices <laughs> making it happen and claiming our space. It's not that we're not that now, but we have had the great, privilege for what we want out of our organization to grow into a national organization and now to be a legacy organization. It's truly phenomenal. It shows how much the work matters and it shows how many people want to be connected to this work. Not every startup wants to become a national legacy organization and that's okay. And not every kind of startup organization needs to do that for their mission. But if you look at actually the history of a lot of the legacy organizations, you'll find it, that they actually started in many ways very similarly to a lot of the newer organizations that are popping up. So for me, I just have a ton of respect for those kinds of groups. I, I, I draw inspiration from it. And I think it's so important because CEOs actually also need to see 
what folks around the country are interested in and where the lines are and where they're willing to push. And for me, it was a moment of, oh gosh, I hadn't even thought of staging a protest where people get arrested and are speaking out this way. It, it helped inspire a whole series of things that we did at NCJW. So those are some of the ways I see all these things intersecting. And so it's with a lot of love that I say, I hope more things pop up. You know, NCJW is uh, happy to partner with anybody who wants to partner with a legacy organization and also super gets it if people want to do their own thing. I think this is really just about making sure everybody has a path to seek justice um, in the way that's most meaningful for them. If you were to think about the landscape of all the issues you're working on, so reproductive justice, which of course links to the courts right now, which links to equity along gender axes more broadly, which links uh, to racial justice questions. I mean, like if, if, if you were going to try and distill for us like a couple takeaways for a listener, what should people be walking away from this episode thinking about and ready to act on? Well, hopefully some of what we'll share right now is evergreen is work that can be done at any time. The thing I want to say is that knowing that this episode is going to drop between now and election day, one of the most critical things that everyone can do is to work to get out the vote. Uh, Making sure that you know your voting plan, making sure everyone in your life knows their voting plan. We are in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of the people who have served as poll workers are higher risk people because they tend to be older. And so more young people and healthy people and able-bodied people who can go volunteer and be on the front lines on election day is crucial. That's number one. Numbers two through 5,000 are really about figuring out where your place on deck is. We need all hands on deck, and there's a lot of deck. And CJW is deep in the work of courts and reproductive rights, health, freedom, and justice. And so if you feel moved in those directions, obviously the judiciary is critical right now. And in an ongoing way, the people who are, ser- are, are, are brought in to serve as judges, they are not fair, independent, and qualified. That impacts American law and people's rights and safety and freedom for generations. So if those are issues that you're particularly activated on, come, come. We, have, we have a lot of work on the ground. We are happy to guide you. If you can figure out where the intersection of your passions, your talents, and your capacities are, figure out how to go make yourself more useful than you are now, because we need you. The best example I can give a really massive change that happens is actually from a small moment that shouldn't feel so small. Um, Emmett Till had been brutally murdered. His mother, Mamie Till, decided in a last minute move to have her son have an open casket. And that picture was then in every newspaper across this country. And it inspired a woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who had never been involved at all, to sign up for activist training. 100 days later, exactly, Rosa Parks refused to give up her rights on a bus, which was not the story we tell to fourth graders, which was actually a planned, organized effort. And as a result of that moment, the course of history was changed. It's not actually the big things that tend to get us on the path towards justice. It's being the right person in the right moment to do the small thing that could be the tipping point moment. And that means we need everyone to do something. And then somebody's going to be that tipping point person. And so, you know, it can be overwhelming, obviously. We're in the middle of a pandemic, abortion access is on the table to potentially go away. Uh, the Affordable Care Act as well. There's so much to be concerned with that could take us into deep despair. And if that's where you need to sit, sit there because it's okay to be in despair in this moment. And then when you can, find something to do, whether it's signing up to be an escort at a Planned Parenthood clinic, whether it's going to a lobbying training for the first time, we just don't know what the conditions are gonna be and who the person is gonna be that's gonna transform 
the next several decades of our country, but it could be you. And you can also email us at action at ncjw.org. If you're looking for something to do and you're just not sure what it is, we've got things that take a minute, we've got things that take days, we've got things that require no training, we've got things that require advanced training, but we're happy to be a facilitator to help you feel like you're taking action in this moment and to know that collectively when we all do that, we really can change history. Thank you both so much for joining us. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for having us. And thanks so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we hope that you'll tune in again in the future. We want to close out this episode in the same way that we always do by encouraging you to be in touch with us. And there are a wide variety of ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Second, you can hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, also Judaism Unbound, for our handles on those various social media sites that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, We've got our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And we also have our email addresses, dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. The last request we'd like to make is that we really deeply appreciate any amount of support that you're able to send our way, which you can do via judaismunbound.com slash donate on either a monthly recurring basis or just as a one-time gift. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.